So let's talk about, first we had layered architecture. Now let's talk about my favorite. Uh, it's one of the other styles you can have. There's many other styles, but hexagonal architecture, also called uh, onion architecture or ports and adapter style architecture. Um, from the implementation side of it, they look very similar to uh, layered architecture. But conceptually, um, uh, hexagonal architectures are really built for portability. They're built for replaceability, so that you can replace any of these pieces within an architecture. And you can have many, many different pieces. I've been in projects where uh, this hexagonal architecture has really paid off very handsomely because um, like I said earlier, with interfaces, interfaces and the hexagonal architecture is a fantastic combination. Um, so let me go a little bit deeper here. In a typical interface or in a typical hexagonal architecture, we have concept of ports. This would be the outside portions here. Port here and another port here and another port here. Just think about as a port as a, f a way to communicate in and out of your service or system. Ports are nothing more than that. There is no intelligence inside the port. And don't, don't go into the details yet on what type of ports it is, not the implementation piece like TCP IP, HTTP, that kind of stuff. Just think of it as a port as a conceptual door, an entry point into your system. That's, that's what this is for, a specific reason or how you enter into the system. Next. Hexagonal architecture have a concept of adapters. So an adapter, an adapter's responsibility really is to get information in and out of a port. The adapter is the one that is the middle man, but so to speak, between the thing in the middle of the hexagonal architecture, which we go into later, right here, and the external piece, the port, the communication. So these adapters, again, are built based on interfaces so these adapters can be replaced in the future at any point in time without affecting any of the other parts of the system whatsoever. Um, this is a fantastic way of structuring very large systems if you have to, or uh, say a microservice that it's fairly complex. We go into that uh, in, the, in one of the other lectures about microservices and how we can take advantage of this type of architecture inside microservices. So for now, just keep the adapters in mind. They have a specific purpose uh, or functionality between the core domain of the system over here and the outside world. Next, um, in the hexagonal architecture, we have concept of application services. These are these are the conductors. You can speak. You can think of it the the application services of one or more application service that talk directly to these adapters. And they know which adapter to, to communicate with when a certain functionality is needed, but they do not have any business logic. This is critical. And we can do that a little bit later. Application services are purely there for things like uh, access to security if needed, um, to conduct communication between different adapters uh, maybe for logging reasons, um, other examples. But keep in mind, they do not house, should not house business logic. This is very critical. They're simply uh, very thin services within the application, within the service, uh, on how to conduct the flow of information in the best way possible. Next, we have domain services. Now here it gets more interesting. So as I mentioned earlier with domain driven design, when you have a core domain, you can think of it as a core domain right inside of this hexagonal architecture. The core domain really is your secret sauce, remember that. So domain services are created, they may not be needed depending how large or how big your system or domain is, but I've seen at least one or two, even in small solutions. Domain services are really meant for whenever you don't have an exact aggregate or an exact place in a domain that could handle this business scenario. Uh, domain services pull the different aggregates within a domain. And what an aggregate means, and we'll go into that 
a little bit later. And aggregate really is a way to have um, a place to invalidate uh, business rules so that aggregates have full control, transactional control of what happens inside the core. And domain services are really the ones that uh, may need to communicate and pull different aggregates together. So think about it like that. If there's no specific aggregate possible, then domain service is a great way to create these and then pull the aggregates together to make a full transaction work. I should correct that. Uh, really aggregates are, or good aggregates, have full transaction control. Domain services are really just conductors within the domain itself, within the core domain here. I would need a little more time to explain this. And in one of the courses that I have, I'll go in a lot more details on how to actually build these uh, domain services and the um, domain model itself. So you're, like I said, Comer, the core domain is inside of, of your hexagonal architecture. The core domain is really just one uh, major aspect of your business that it, that it provides a solution for. Application services communicate to the adapters. And um, one, one thing I want to point out is that the adapters, is, if you look at here, they never communicate between the adapters. This is also very critical because you want to be able to replace an adapter if you needed to in the future or make some serious or some heavy changes to it. So keep that in mind. Adapters never communicate directly to another adapter. You don't want that. You only want the application services communicating to the individual adapters in the system. Here's an example of um, just a very basic example of hexagonal architecture where you have your, your billing domain in the right in the center here. Billing domain about uh, subscription products, invoices, chargers, those kind of things. And the billing domain handles this inside the core of it. We have a subscription service in a, uh, a subscription core domain service. We have um, going up one more layer here, the application service. We have command handlers. It's another way of uh, processing information coming in. So in one of the other courses that I have, I'll actually, we actually go into how to build these command handlers as well. And one command could be purchase subscription with a credit card command. That command enters into the application service and it gets processed inside the domain. The adapters that you see here are the different uh, ways to communicate to and from the system. For example, um, this command here uh, could be put into a queue in AWS SQS. The queue then gets fired uh, by, by a Lambda service and it ends up inside the adapter. And so the, uh, the adapter then takes the command and hands it off to a command handler. The command handler then instead looks at it, what type of command it is, and starts processing it and sends it into maybe to the subscription service or to one of the aggregates inside the domain to actually process and handle that request, that command that came into the system. Um, and so in the meantime, the domain or the application services can, can access any of these adapters, maybe store the command in an S3 bucket uh, while it's processing this asynchronously. Uh, and eventually, probably, uh, one of the adapters like the DynamoDB adapter will store maybe the, the uh, domain event that's getting triggered eventually. Uh, so my point is that I could replace theoretically any of these adapters say if I want to go with a different cloud provider I want to go with a Google cloud provider and uh, I can replace these adapters with maybe the, the Google cloud services or maybe replace um, or add adapters for Azure cloud services so my point is that uh, the core domain of it should not be affected at all so you can actually isolate the from a strategic point of view into the implementation side. Uh, if you do want to be cloud agnostic in uh, creating a, a microservice, that these adapters will help you tremendously, especially also for testing the whole system. Some of these, all, all of these adapters will be based on interfaces, remember that. And so because they're based on interfaces, that uh, I, can, I can create dummy adapters, in-memory dummy adapters, 
to fully test the integration of all these different components inside the architecture. So this is a great way of uh, designing a modern solution, in my opinion. All right, so that was a lot of information, I think, at least for the beginning. And um, I highly, highly recommend that you must read a five-minute article by Martin Fowler. If you haven't heard about Martin Fowler, he's the unofficial um, ruler of, so of the software industry. If he has not spoken about a topic, it's not official. So Martin Fowler has been spoken, has been speaking about artificial, I mean, sacrificial architecture for a long time. I love that. Take a look. Uh, there's a link in here. I have some more links uh, below in these uh, lectures, so to help you uh, catch up on some of these things. But um, read this one. It's only about five minutes long, and it will hopefully open up your eyes. Uh, he really talks about. And, and I strongly agree with Martin Fowler that whatever you create, if it's a greenfield project or if you take an existing system, eventually whatever has been created will need to be retired or replaced. Now the key is it's perfectly fine to throw away everything you've built two or three years from now because you don't know what will come up three years from now. There might be something coming up that's um, a huge time saver from a business point of view. And it, it, there could be cases when the system studio that you have created or an existing system is so complex, it's, uh, it's not worth it to maintain it anymore. Or it might be the other way around. It could be that it's totally fine, it's operating okay. However, there are other benefits if you completely throw away the system that you created or at least major pieces of it. And so his point is, just to give you the, the excitement now, is that when you design an architecture, you should make the decision on being able to replace any of the pieces inside the architecture. Remember, what I mentioned at the beginning is the component parts of it. Any of these components in your architecture, you should be able to replace. And so that will buy you a whole lot of uh, advantages. It will save you a lot of headaches, not just for yourself, but for the company that you work for or for your own company, for the organization. Uh, make it maintainable, make it being able to compose out of different components and be very uh, careful of how many components you put into an architecture. And with that, I hope you like this section and I'll see you in the next lecture.